Thanks, Terry. It's great to be here uh, with you this afternoon and to have the opportunity to talk about what I think uh, may be one of the most important issues and topics that we need to address in the fields of special education and vocational rehabilitation and supported employment and, and our other related fields, and that is promoting and enhancing self-determination. In the short time we have together, I'd like to try to cover a few primary topics. Uh, first, I'd like to provide a brief overview of how the self-determination construct has been used in education and in rehabilitation so that we have a shared understanding of what I'm referring to when I use the term. Uh, and I'd also like to touch on a few misperceptions of what is meant by self-determination that serve, I think, to limit the opportunities that many people with disabilities have to become more self-determined and to uh, seek greater career and job outcomes. Then I'd like to briefly talk a little bit about what we know about the self-determination of people with disabilities and the importance of that, that outcome to outcomes like employment and independent living. Finally, I'd like to talk about the potential benefits of promoting and enhancing self-determination for vocational and employment outcome and we'll introduce you to a model we're using uh, to infuse self-determination into the vocational rehabilitation process in our state as a way to just provide an example of the types of activities in which we as professionals and others can be engaged. So without further ado, let me talk about what we mean by the term self-determination. Self-determination has fundamentally two basic meanings. Uh, as you can see from this slide, the first refers fundamentally to a personal sense of the construct, the determination of one's own fate or course of action without compulsion. Um, and the second meaning or intent of the construct applies to what I'll call a national, political, or, or corporate sense of the term, uh, generally associated with freedom and referring to the rights of people or peoples to, to self-governance and to determine often their own political status. In the fields of education and psychology and largely in rehabilitation, uh, when we use the term self-determination, we're talking in the personal sense, the sense of enabling people to have greater control over their own fate and their own destinies and to prepare people to do so uh, in, a, in a manner that, that promotes both uh, skills and knowledge and, and provides opportunities to use those skills and knowledge. Um, there is a, a, a very vibrant and strong uh, effort in uh, many uh, areas of, of disability services and supports to promote self-determination through mechanisms uh, such as um, independent funding uh, and independent budgeting, uh, person-centered planning, and uh, other mechanisms that enable people to have greater control over funding streams and decisions about their um, service um, delivery and the, the payments and, and the delivery of those, those supports. Um, I think these are complementary efforts. Um, certainly the systems change efforts have focused to create greater opportunity for people with disabilities. Uh, meanwhile, efforts to promote personal uh, self-determination better enable people uh, to take advantage of those opportunities when they exist. So I will be focusing primarily, however, on the sense of the term as a personal construct. Uh, there's often um, attempts to come to synonyms to, to capture what is meant by self-determination. Self-determination can be a relatively complex construct that doesn't have immediately um, discernible meanings to, to a lot of people. Um, we tend to fall back on um, some of the, the key components of self-determined behavior, choice making or decision making or problem solving. 
But I'd like to, to emphasize that I think if we're looking for a synonym for self-determination, it's, it's the idea of enabling people to become self-governing. And again, you can see uh, from this slide that self-governing has two principal meanings that, that uh, really overlap with the, the personal and the corporate or um, political sense of the term self-determination. But one of the things that we want to do is to enable people to exercise control or rule, uh, rule over themselves uh, and to be able to um, implement goal-oriented activities that um, enable them to achieve longer-term outcomes than just looking at immediate gratification. So one of the things we want to talk about is how do we um, enable people to be self-governing and to, to exercise control both over themselves and over their environments and, and activities that impact their lives. Um, let me share with you for just uh, very quickly some of the, the definitions that have uh, sprung up in education and psychology and rehabilitation. Michael Ward, uh, who was with the Department of Education at the time of the initial education self-determination initiatives, pointed out that really being self-determined is not only about skills and knowledge enhancement, but it's also about the attitudes and beliefs and perceptions that the person brings to their life and applies to their world. So that we're looking at both attitudes, uh, enhancing uh, perceptions of control and autonomy and, and enabling people to acquire the skills and knowledge that lead them to do things like uh, Dr. Ward uh, indicates. Defining goals, goal-oriented goal actions are central to uh, self-determination and self-determined behavior. Sharon Field and Alan Hoffman similarly define self-determination as relating to ability to define and achieve goals. And again, this focuses on the centrality of goal-oriented behavior in, in self-determined actions, but also on a foundation of knowing and valuing oneself. That is, uh, that people who are self-determined know what they do well, uh, know what they like, uh, know what they don't do well, and they, they try to put themselves in circumstances where they can take advantage of what they do well and minimize circumstances where they are not going to be able to succeed. Dennis Smithog at Columbia University has talked about self-determination as choosing and enacting choice in persistent pursuit of self-interest. I think it's important not to minimize the role of choice making and, and uh, uh, self-interest in, in pursuing uh, self-determined outcomes. Fundamentally, most of us um, prefer certain employment or vocational outcomes and we we, we choose our jobs and our careers based on those preferences. So it's important that we know what we like, what we don't like, and that we, we live ways that begin to, to enact choice and, and preference in our lives. In our work, we've used the term causal agency and causal agent to define self-determined behavior. Uh, people who are self-determined act as, as the primary causal agent in their life and make choices and decisions. Uh, that impact their quality of life free from undue external influence or interference. And I think the term causal agency captures to a large degree what we really mean when we talk about self-determined people and self-determination. A causal agent is someone who makes or causes things to happen in his or her own life. As I'll talk about in a moment, we have misperceptions about what self-determination is and many people with disabilities are often limited in their opportunity to both learn skills that will enable them to be more self-determined but also in uh, having experiences and engaging in activities that enable them to exert greater control over their life because primarily people other people assume that the severity or type of disability limits the number of activities in which they can engage and that if someone can't do something completely independently 
that uh, they're not able to do it. And the fact of the matter is that most of us uh, rely on others and other systems to do things for us that enhance the quality of our lives. And it's really not about doing those things ourselves, but it's about making those things happen. That we can, we can do that by expressing our preferences, by participating in decisions that impact our life, by uh, establishing goals to govern uh, aspects of our life like uh, job and, and, and career development. Um, but that it's not about doing everything for oneself. It's, it's about making things happen in one's life. And that virtually every person, in fact, I would argue every person, has the capacity to have that kind of impact and to make things happen in his or her life, even if it's as simple as voicing uh, an opinion or a preference about a particular uh, activity or action. Let me continue a little bit on some of what I'll call misperceptions of self-determination um, because I believe that in many cases people with disabilities are denied opportunities to exert greater control in their lives because of these issues and because of these misperceptions. And as I've mentioned, one of the most common misperceptions about self-determined behavior and self-determination is that, that it means doing it yourself, that self-determination is equated with independent performance of uh, certain and often complex behaviors, and that if you're not able to make, for example, a complex uh, medical decision, that uh, you are not, in fact, able to be self-determined. And I think, again, as I've emphasized, self-determination is about making things happen in your life, and you don't have to be able to solve the most complex problems or make complex decisions. A colleague of mine, Harlan Russo, provided an example of how exerting control and making things happen in one's life uh, and independent performance of behaviors and doing it yourself are, are decoupled. And she, she tells the story of a sculptor uh, who has uh, mus multiple uh, physical limitations. Um, and she sculpts by giving precise instructions to her assistants, who in essence serve as her hands. And uh, while it's tempting to think that her assistants are the true artists, she is in fact the sculptor in charge when she is given the same directions to two assistants who have had no contact with one another they both produce identical pieces of sculpture. Through the experience of disability, this woman has learned to articulate her vision and her needs in direct and specific ways, so much so that she gets precisely the, the help and the type of assistance that she needs in ways that are replicable. So it really is her that is the sculptor, and, not, and, and the fact that she cannot manipulate the clay on her own is, is irrelevant. So people who are self-determined are people who make things happen. They, they are causal agents in their lives, independent of whether they actually perform the action or not. Another misperception is that self-determination is about absolute control, when in fact other synonyms for self-determination might include direct and manage. People can have a greater role in directing uh, aspects of, of, of career uh, placement and decision making and, and, and other activities that are in, involved in uh, getting people uh, real meaningful jobs and supporting them to do that. So it's not about absolute control, it's about managing and directing uh, aspects of one's lives. It's also not strictly about self-reliance and self-sufficiency. We want to enable people to be more self-reliant and more self-sufficient, but in truth, all of us get by with a little help from our friends, as it were, and none of us are truly self-reliant or self-sufficient. So a person who needs extensive supports, either through a personal attendant or through a job coach or other uh, forms of supports, um, can still be self-determined, even if they, they are not uh, uh, completely self-sufficient. Uh, and then a final note is that self-determination is not about a way of providing services or doing planning or any of those things. We tend to programatize innovations in our field, and it is often the case that uh, 
people think that self-determination is simply a student-directed planning meeting or a particular way of budgeting, when in fact it is about enabling people to be causal agents in their lives and to be actors in their lives instead of being acted upon. Do you recall the, commercial, the television commercial uh, that ran uh, a year or so ago advertising an internet-based internet job search firm in which young children stand before the camera and make statements such as, when I grow up I want to be downsized and I want to work in a dull, boring job for the rest of my life and re retire to a meager pension. The point of that ad is that, of course, nobody wants a bad or a boring job and that nobody should have to settle for such a job. Yet we find ourselves even today uh, within the circumstance where thousands of Americans with disabilities continue to earn sub-minimum wages in sheltered environments with no, no promise or hope for promotion or chance for inclusion into the mainstream of American society. And despite the really impressive um, growth of supported employment over the last decade and decade and a half, um, we find that even when our economy is, is booming and the employment rate was at all-time lows, people with disabilities still experienced depressingly high rates of, of unemployment. So we have to ask ourselves, what more can we do other than what we already have been doing, which has certainly had impact. And I think that one of the solutions, one of the things that we can and should be doing is to enable people to become their own support and to focus on issues of self-determination. This is not only my opinion, but it's also, uh, I think, validated by research. Um, research shows uh, unequivocally that self-determined youth achieve more positive adult outcomes. Uh, research we have conducted looking at the impact of self-determination for young people with intellectual disabilities has shown that being self-determined is an important contributor to more positive adult outcomes, particularly employment and wage-related outcomes. In this uh, research, young people with cognitive disabilities who were self-determined were more than twice as likely to be employed for pay one year after high school and were earning, on the average, more than two dollars per hour more than their peers who were equivalent as a group in educational experiences and level of ability but who were not self-determined. Three years after graduation students who were self-determined were significantly more likely to have a job that provided benefits such as paid vacation, health care, and sick leave. Not surprisingly I think these self-determined young people also were more likely to live independently uh, by three years post-graduation and to have and maintain a checking account and to do other things more independently. It, not surprising because working after all provides the obvious benefit of having money which allows one to do many other things that enhance one's quality of life. There is a, another line of research that provides really overwhelming evidence that adolescents and adults with disabilities can learn a number of strategies like antecedent cue regulation and picture cue strategies, self-instruction, self-monitoring, self-evaluation, all to increase independence and productivity in work situations. We know we can increase the independence and self-direction and self-management of, of people, adults and young uh, and adolescents with disabilities in work environments through a number of, of the student-directed and self-directed learning strategies. What are some of the benefits of promoting self-determination in vocational employment settings? Well, um, there are a number. First of all, self-determined people set uh, employment and career goals based on their own abilities, interests, and preferences. So we minimize the possibility that, that young people and adults are, are placed in employment situations that are not a good match with their abilities, interests, and preferences. Uh, Self-determined people can solve problems that arise in work environments and barriers to obtaining desired jobs. We know that one, uh, uh, one particular barrier relates to holding and maintaining employment uh, for people once they have, have been uh, successfully 
achieved a job, and that in this case, in that case, it's often the case that we that there are, are problems that arise, sometimes social in nature, sometimes work-related, that, that the person might rely on somebody else to solve if they have not had adequate experience and, and opportunity to learn how to solve those problems themselves. Another benefit is that by enabling people to become more self-determined, we enable them to advocate on their own behalf for better jobs for better job conditions and we don't rely on that uh, coming from other people who may not be around or as knowledgeable as the person him or herself. And also to be able to identify the supports both natural and other and accommodations that the person needs to succeed. So those are all important uh, aspects of, of uh, why we should be focusing on promoting and enhancing self-determination particularly within employment and, and rehabilitation uh, settings. I would note that there's also a considerable emphasis on self-determination in federal legislation across the board governing uh, policy and practice uh, for the delivery of supports to people with disabilities. The Rehabilitation Act includes in the findings from Congress that the, the goals of the nation are rightly intended to support and promote self-determination. And of course, the Rehabilitation Act also includes language around the informed choice in selecting employment outcomes, specific vocational services to be provided, uh, and the entity that will provide the vocational rehabilitation plan. So, so we are charged throughout the rehabilitation process and really the employment process to, to focusing on enabling people to self-regulate uh, processes that lead them to greater uh, employment outcomes. I would take a look at some of the activities that might suggest that uh, uh, an agency is providing supports that are consistent with enhancing and promoting self-determination. You might look at whether your agency provides systematic supports to enable supported employees to set long and short-term vocational employment and career goals. Is there a mechanism that, that employees are supported to actually set goals and to work toward those goals? Uh, does the agency provide a systematic support to enable supported employees to identify and communicate their unique vocational and career interests and preferences? We often overlook the fact that it's the person, him or herself, who's the best source of information about career and job preferences and interests. Does your agency implement person-centered planning processes uh, and provide support to enable supported employees to serve as equal partners in his or her planning, uh, habilitation and otherwise planning? And does the agency provide supports to enable supported employees to make informed decisions about employment and career options? And does, does it provide a sufficient number of employment options related to supported employment, or sorry, sorry, the supported employees' preferences? Can, for example, a supported employee select and change job coaches if they're dissatisfied with their current circumstance? Does the agency have a systematic process to inform supported employees about their work and civil rights protections and responsibilities? And do you provide services that enable supported employees and others to assume leadership roles and participate in meaningfully in decision-making bodies within the work setting as well as the agency? I'd like to close by sharing with you uh, an example of some of the work that we've been doing within the context of the vocational rehabilitation system in our state. Um, we have, with funding from... Um, the Rehab Services Administration developed a uh, career development model that uh, enables uh, folks to self-regulate the problem solving to support uh, their involvement in the process of getting a job and hopefully establishing a career. There are three phases uh, in this self-determined career development model. Each phase has a problem to solve. Um, which I'll talk about in just a minute. In each phase, consumers solve the problem by answering four questions. Um, and the solution to each problem in each phase leads 
intuitively to the next problem that needs to be solved. Um, and throughout the process, participants learn employment support strategies that they need to answer the questions. And so we provide an opportunity for people to learn new skills like goal setting and problem solving in the context of a self-directed process. The first phase of this process, the problem to solve, is what are my career and job goals? Um, and as I mentioned, there are four questions in each phase that consumers uh, answer in order to solve the problem of career and job goals. The first one is what career and job do I want? So what we enable people to explore preferences and interests, uh, to look at career awareness issues, and to, to really look at what career and job they might want. The second question is, what do I know about it now? So once someone has narrowed down uh, the scope and sequence of the types of jobs they might prefer, and, and narrowed it hopefully to a particular job, uh, they look at what they know about it now. What, uh, what do they need to know more about it? Perhaps they need to, to learn a little bit more. And so we would engage in, a, in an exploration process or perhaps even doing an internship so that the person could maximize what they learn about the process. The third question in the first phase is what must change for me to get the job and career I want? You had the person, we've enabled the person to discover what it is that they need to achieve the job and so now we take a look at that as the goal and we take a look at where the current the, the person's current status is and identify what needs to be changed and sometimes that those barriers or those things that need to be changed refer to external aspects uh, perhaps the person needs transportation or child care and that's the only barrier or, or thing that needs to change other times, perhaps the person will need to learn specific job-related skills or social or organizational skills. And then the final step, the final question that the person is supported to answer is, what can I do to make this happen? And the, the intent of this question, in answering this question, the person is to set a goal uh, that is based on the exploration they have done this. I would note that we work with people who have less complex verbal and cognitive skills and that the person is kept as the causal agent in the process whether they can independently answer each question or not. And that is done through our roles as facilitators. The, the employment uh, supports strategies that will be implemented to enable people to answer these questions inclu include a number, and I won't deal with any of them extensively, but communication instruction, awareness training, uh, enabling someone to self-assess job or career preferences and abilities, career and job exploration activities. Uh, perhaps the person hasn't had opportunities for job shadowing and sampling and needs to go back to that step to better understand. Organizational skills training and problem solving instruction. Those are all supports that are intended to enable the person to answer the questions in that first phase as well as choice making, uh, decision making, goal setting instruction. The second phase, the problem to solve, is what is my plan? So participants come out of the first phase with a specific goal that has been set and, and self-set. The problem to solve is what is my plan? And the questions that persons uh, address to solve that problem include what actions can I take to reach my career or employment goal? What could keep me from taking action, what barriers exist to my taking action, what can I do to remove these barriers, so what will need to happen, and then when will I take action. And as part of this final process, we ask uh, participants to set up a self-monitoring process to enable them to track uh, their progress toward their goal. Employment support strategies in this uh, phase include exploration of community resources and supports, problem-solving instruction, self-scheduling training, self-instruction training, antecedent cue regulation, decision-making instruction, things generally geared toward enabling people to self-regulate and to self-direct the process of, of monitoring and implementing the activities, including self-advocacy instruction, assertiveness training, and self-monitoring. 
And the final phase of the, the process, uh, the problem to solve is what have I achieved? And to, to answer, to solve that problem, participants answer the questions, what actions have I taken? What barriers have been removed? What, what has changed to enable me to get the job and career I want? And what have I achieved, or have I achieved what I want to achieve? So we're looking at enabling people, particularly with the final question, to take a look at whether they are where they want to, to be. And if they're not, uh, they have several courses of action that they consider. The first is to just keep working at it. Maybe they haven't worked long enough. The second is to to modify their action plan. Perhaps they aren't working at it enough and their action plan requires some modification. So they would go back to phase two and work uh, through that process to modify it again. And then the third option is whether their goal was appropriate. If their action plan is appropriate, then perhaps the goal was inappropriate. And this is particularly important, I think, because in many cases we find ourselves in circumstances where, where we have to be dream killers and we have to tell people that we don't believe that a particular goal is appropriate or, or reasonable. And this process enables people to make decisions about their goal and the reasonableness and the appropriateness of it with us as allies and advocates and not having to be in the form of a regulator. So there, I, I wanted to um, use that to illustrate the types of activities, obviously, we're using a, a process that enables adults to, as much as possible, self-regulate learning and not putting them in a position where they would simply be in a classroom or in a role of authority under a, a teacher, but to support people through the active process. There are a lot of things, and I certainly couldn't touch on them in the 30 minutes we've had that we can continue to do, though, and I hope that some of the activities that I've uh, indicated provide at least uh, a touch on some of the activities that we can engage in. And at that, I'll turn it back over to you, Terry.